to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of people to have inspiring and insightful conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. So with life changes over the past few years, do you feel like your mojo has gone on holidays without you? You know, that magical feeling that comes from being joyful and feeling connected, from living with purpose and meaning and having a creative flow? Well, today my guest is here to highlight that your creative, playful spark always resides within you. And it just waits patiently for you to reconnect with it so that you can thrive both personally and professionally. So on that note, let me introduce you to Michael Dixon. Welcome, Michael. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Yeah, great. Thank you. So let me just tell everyone a little bit more about you before we get into this really juicy conversation. Great. So Michael's an award-winning speaker, award-winning author master facilitator, professional jazz musician, and recognized authority of creativity, culture, and the human future of work. He helps visionary leaders and high-performing teams rediscover their innate gifts, redefine unique value, and reimagine their collective impact in work and life with astonishing success. Through the design and delivery of electrifying keynotes, immersive team building exercises and experiences, and transformational talent development programs, Michael leads a new wave of entrepreneurial savants showing forward thinking companies how to reinvent for relevance in, in the 21st century renaissance. Fantastic, exciting. That sounds impressive. I oh, know, super impressive. I'm so, I, I, I'm so grateful to have wow. such impressive Wow, can't wait guests. to meet him. Yeah, big round of applause for him. <laughs> Brilliant, I love it. I should have actually got you to um, to just record the music as I said all that and then we gonna, wouldn't even I, have to edit music in. I was going to think about a little soundtrack for you, but no, I didn't want to throw you off. <laughs> I'll save that. <laughs> So firstly, congratulations on your latest book. So your latest book, Everyday Creative, A Dangerous Guide to Making Magic at Work, has been voted the number one leadership book in Australia in 2021 mm. um, by Australian Business Book Awards. So congratulations. Thank you. That was very surprising and delighting all at once. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. So you bring a really unique skill set and life experience as a musician to organisational success conversation. Mm. And your approach to me is really refreshing and entertaining and certainly creative. Mm. So well-known leadership coach, Simon Sinek, he spread the message over the last, I don't know, quite a number of years of start with your why. Mm -hmm. So I'm keen to understand more about your why. I have wonderful, deep wounds, like everyone on the planet. We've all got our unique blend, our own idiosyncratic um, spread of heartache and, you know, moments that have, that have shaped who we are um, because we were hurt or ostracized or not allowed in the cool club or whatever it was when we were five, seven, 12, 13. And those, those kind of wounds, um, have shaped a worldview. And that worldview for me is that I really am fascinated by and addicted to creating spaces that enable and encourage the full self-expression of others. So ultimately, mm. there were certain moments in my life where I didn't feel safe or when I stepped out and I was creative and I was fully self-expressed and I was dancing and playing and singing and I was laughed at or I was made fun of or humiliated in some way. And I didn't like that feeling. Mm. And so, <clears throat> um, it, it, you know, if there was a golden thread through all the multitude of different career moves and and life experiences I've had it all seems to come back to this idea of creating these spaces that are psychologically safe to use a, a current zeitgeist term thanks to Amy Edmondson um, but spaces where people feel safe enough to be courageous enough 
to share their unfil- unfinished, unpolished, untested ideas, to to playfully engage with the moment and what's emerging for them to to lean in and laugh and giggle and learn out loud and have fun while they're doing it. Mm, I love it. I love it. And how's that going? You know, it's an interesting question. I um, and, and thinking with an organisational spin on it. So I certainly, my background is in jazz and music and the arts entertainment sector. And then I, I um, yeah, I mean, I've done a, a range of different things, part-time jobs, you know, to supplement income in as a cook or a barista or landscape gardener or whatever, you know, like every job you can think of, I've had it for a week or two. Mm. And, um, you know, amongst, you know, playing music and even busking full time, I did that for a year. But now that I've ended up in this, in this corporate world, in the beginning, I was an anomaly. So there was really something different and unique. Wow, this is a really fresh spin. And I felt very out of my depth a lot of the time I had to learn the lay of the land I had to learn the language and I felt a lot of the time the imposter syndrome that many of us feel when they're moving into markets or careers or or spaces where they're unfamiliar Mm -hmm. it's like oh my god what am I doing I'm going to get found out at some point (laughs) but people kept saying no there's something really good that you do there's there's an approach there's a perspective that you add that we don't have in business Mm -hmm. and that kind of kept me going even though I felt like that imposter but now I do speak the language and now I do understand a lot of the landscape. It's been a good seven, eight years now that I've been deeply embedded in, in organizations and leadership and programs or events or training, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I worry sometimes that maybe it's finally starting to, to rub off mm. and a little bit of that edge and a little bit of that sheen or the, the magic of, of being so outside. Um, am I, have I been pulled a little further to the center? And so I'm, I guess I'm on a quest, a very relevant current quest is uh, I think all of us out, out of, as a result of the pandemic, I mean, I read the other day, 89% of people globally, I mean, that's a, that's a big broad statistic, but, but, but if we were to take that, um, you know, for, for what it's worth, 89% of people are, are really reconsidering their relationship with work and their career as a result of the last two years. And I'm not immune to that. Mm. And even though a lot of the work I do is to help people reconsider their relationship with work and how they can bring more of themselves to their career and their professional, their vocation. Uh, it's also, I'm starting to question mm. and I'm starting to think, well, hang on, what am I doing? What's really um, what I'm meant to do? Am I, am I adding value in the way that sets my soul on fire or mm. am I starting to slip and succumb and be influenced and conditioned by these deeply entrenched mm. um, kind of social norms that, that mm. exist in that organizational landscape. So it's an, it's an interesting time for me at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, thanks for sharing that with such honesty. And it's great because you're, you're, everybody's doing different things, but everybody's asking very similar questions. And as an artist background, and as you said, someone who's always wanted to create that space for reflection and thinking you're a person that would naturally I suppose do that every now and again have reflection journal you know Mm -hmm. think about you know what's going on and why am I doing this and is it is it aligned with my values Mm -hmm. but it's so beautiful because we're seeing that now not just in people that would usually do that but we're seeing that sort of conversation being embraced in companies as well so that's that's awesome Mm -hmm. um There was a question I was going to ask you towards the end, but I want to ask it now because of what because of what you've just shared. Start at the end. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, We'll end at the beginning. Exactly. This is a creative conversation. (laughs) (laughs) So, you said that you're starting to question whether what you're doing one is creating the impact that you want to create. Mm -hmm. It's creating the spark inside you that you want to want to feel. But I'm wondering if your if companies are really embracing your why and whether um, whether you think that it's your method or your mode, so your motivational style that companies are buying. And do you think the companies are looking at ways to just keep people connected and motivated, or are they really open to implementing creative play in everyday solutions? I love this question, Lisa. And let's go for the jugular. (laughs) 
So, so I, everything. I was a bit. I kept that question to the end because I was like, I'll just see what he's like and whether. I'm <laughs> whether up for it. No, I, 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 it. Yeah, no, I love this stuff. I, I just think that we. I mean, this is what we need more of. We need more real, honest, fully transparent conversations, and it doesn't allow that a lot of the time. And it's so embedded, the um, you know, the facade and the positioning and and the politics and there's so many cultural memes and, and and ways of being in in the workplace that don't allow for this kind of conversation to be had but but in truth this is just my experience and at this point in time so it's probably colored by you know the reflections that i'm making anyway but i would say that <clears throat> recent experience um well no i'd say pretty much the whole experience there's what they want um there's what they need and then there's what they end up getting and what they want is i think i think when they they see me or they experience me at an event uh if they experience me in full flight in a, in an, a way that i'm delivering where it's just unequivocally me so it might be an event that i'm running or it's a conference where i've got free reign mm -hmm. there quite often is it's very electric like there's a moment it's very raw and, and it, it kind of is it's well, you feel like you're on the edge of the seat. I, I do a lot of work with the audience, very interactive. It's very spontaneous. It's very like, let's go all oh, this, there's momentum happening in this moment. Let's follow that. Let's go deeper in that. And then, and then bringing, you know, if something happens that's off script, which is fantastic, then we drill down into that. And then we, you know, let's, let's go there. <clears throat> Cause that's the stuff that really makes a difference. That's, that's the Absolutely. transformation. So they might see that and go, we want that. And we, they might not know how to articulate it, but they know the experience that they've had. And they're like, I want to give this to my team or I want my organization to have this. There's something in that experience I had with you or there's something in that video that you put out that I feel. There's something in what you do that I want to give to my team. The moment that it then shifts into that, cool. So I've just got to get Trish and, and um, Tina and also Alan on the call. And uh, we've also got to get the HR director because she's just got to um, go across <laughs> a few things. And, and well, look, um, Tony, he's, he's a new CEO. And so he's also, um, he's got a few ideas himself that he wants to, um, you know, introduce to the day. And suddenly the whole thing, you know, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen mm -hmm. and, and those cooks, you know, their intent that they're coming with, mm -hmm. some of them are for the good of the organization, but a lot of them, if we're really honest about it, are about protecting their their position mm -hmm. are about hitting their KPI are about delivering what they need to deliver by the end of the quarter, or this is just a project and they just so they're dotting I's and crossing T's. And then a lot of it gets reduced and then a lot of it gets diluted. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of the magic that could be possible, mm -hmm. certainly that that's the stuff that brings me alive and makes the biggest difference to them unconsciously maybe, or just, uh, just unfortunately gets engineered out. Mm. And so then you're left with this thing that's half kind of what it could have been cool. And yeah. then what, what, what I find really disempowering about that is at the end of it, then if there are, if there's something that, you know, at the end they go, yeah, it was good. You know, I think it was good. It possibly, you know, I think we were looking for rah, rah, rah. It's really hard for me then to say, well, that's what I was wanting to bring you. That's what you were initially engaged me for. It's just that you then spent three months whittling this thing down into this safe beige, you know, half in half out experience that of course it was going to be less than the experience that you initially saw me at or engaged me on because you, you know, you didn't have the faith or you didn't, mm. you know what I mean? So it's kind of, um, it's, and the, and the, I say that, with full awareness of and a deep empathy for what it is like to be inside an organization. Now I've never worked for a, for a big corporate, but I've worked with a lot of big corporates and I see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult. It's yeah. very difficult to, to go, Hey, we're just going to do this crazy, wild, risky thing. And people don't have much context about it, but just trust me, it's going to be great. Mm. That takes a lot of courage. Yes. Um, and it takes a lot of, of putting skin in the game and putting your brand on the line as an employee, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. However, uh, yep. you know, this is the tension that we're in where it's like, it, I see it every day. I could, I could, I know how I could be incredibly successful. And I hope that this doesn't sound too arrogant. Um, but I, I can see the formula of how to be incredibly successful by playing out a particular thing. It doesn't really force anyone to change or confront anything about themselves, 
but it's kind of entertaining. And there's a few cool statistics and a, and a great case study. And we do a nice, safe little activity. And everyone at the end of the day goes, that was nice. That was cool. I really enjoyed that. And then that was it. Hmm. And, and Tick, that worked. He was safe. He didn't challenge us too much. He made us look good. Let's get him in again. Hmm. But then nothing changes. Hmm. I absolutely hear you on all of this um, because I've been in the wellbeing, um, the corporate wellbeing world for over 20 years and I've seen the different changes and the different progressions and what companies will and won't embrace and the red tape mm. and the policies and the procedures and the, the fact of how long it takes sometimes for things to happen and who has to, who has to sign off and all of those things. So I completely um, mm. resonate with a mm. lot of what you're saying. Um, but what's interesting is that um, I started backwards on my notes, like on the last page of my notes taken for you and the, and you covered something which was just above the last, the, the selling creativity to companies um, yeah. part that I started with. And that yeah. is, does ensuring best practice and being somewhat married to structure and policies mm. stifle creativity solutions and possibilities <laughs> yeah it and it does but it's it's like it's never it's not binary like it's really difficult in that there's not going to be this one way and 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 it's difficult because if you're in an organization and you've got to manage a thousand people and there's 500 different projects going at once and there's a crm going on while there's also there's mm. you know the it department and then there's hr and this i mean it's so complex absolutely so you've got to find some systems and processes or else it's just going to be madness. You cannot have a thousand people making it up as they go along and dancing around and what, you know, there's got to be some architecture that holds this thing together. Mm. And at the same time, so holding two almost opposing ideas at once, there's got to be that freedom to break best practice. There's got to be the freedom to, to dance and play, to let a meeting go on longer than it's supposed to, or cut a meeting shorter when it's not working, there's got to be you know, the, the freedom to take a little more time with a customer, even though they might not be a big sale, but but it's it's meaningful and it matters and there's something good happening in that moment and it can't be, mm -hmm. I've only been allocated 15 minutes to you or, you know, or you're a yeah. lawyer or a tax agent, you're on the clock. It's there's We've got to find more of a balance and, and develop our, our skills and awareness as individuals, but also collectively as an organization Mm. we've got to start learning nuance and we've got to start bringing more um, depth and breadth to the way that we think about our work. And, and, and I think that the arts are a really great way of doing that. And this might be a nice tie in it back to creativity because, mm -hmm. because music is such a great, um, a great tool for that. But, but any art, it, what, what I see is missing so much is the nuance in yeah. society, but but particularly in organisations, just down to little things like like I had um, a client write this morning to me saying, "Oh, we just want to get your AV requirements." And the venue has asked about, um, do, do, "Do you want supplier meals for your for the band?" You know, so I'm taking the band. I take the band a lot when I do offsites and events. And I wrote back and I said, "Oh, yeah, cool. Send through the rider." And on the rider, and I just had to make it clear, "Hey, listen, the band require." full meals equal to the guests and they require you know their own green room or their own table you know rah, rah, rah. it's not putting them in the back room giving them half a slice of cold chicken and a bread roll like has been done so much at weddings and events and corporate events rah, rah, rah. like th there's just this there's this gross misunderstanding of what talent and what what um of where the magic is. And so the, the band should be heroed and and supported and and given full meals and given the whole, you know, they just, it's like, mm -hmm. look at what they're doing. These people have invested 20, 30, 40 years of their life mastering their craft. They're gonna take your event to the next level. They are gonna create an experience and atmosphere that is mm -hmm. gonna open up your people. They are the reason for that. Why aren't they? red carpet rolled out, you know, hero, ra rah, 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 But it's just the way that we think is, oh, it's just the Absolutely. band, we'll throw them in the corner. And that's, that's a metaphor, it's just an example of how so many things in an organizational context, we invest heavily in the things that don't really matter or make a difference. And the things that do matter and make the biggest difference, we just don't even see them. We just, yeah. we, we completely miss the point.
Yeah. And that's why conversations like this are really important because it is a mindset thing. And it's, um, you know, like you said earlier about having empathy for the people in the companies because they've got to go through all these different processes and they've got to, you know, think about all these different complexities. Mm. I think it's the same thing here. It's about having, I suppose, that that empathy that gets backed up in then action of mm. trying to teach um to teach or educate that they're that it is just a mindset thing it's not that they are trying to do the bad thing it's just that they've never thought about it it's Absolutely. that they don't understand it's like when you talked about just before about um you know letting a meeting run over time even if it's not going to bring back a whole lot of profit because mm -hmm. it's not bringing back direct profit but there is such a ripple effect. One is that you're developing a relationship with whoever you're having the meeting with. Mm. But apart from developing that relationship and where that relationship might go, it's also bringing a sense of when you have a good experience and a good interaction with some, somebody, we feel good. When, we have a, when, when it's a short, sharp, very sterile interaction, we feel yeah. meh, meh. Yeah. You know, and so when you have a really good interaction, the energy that you are then taking back to your work, um, work tasks and to do lists and all of the structures that they like you to hit on all those KPIs and all that sort of stuff, you're bringing an energy of enthusiasm and an energy of connection. And yeah. so that is where that magic of extending that meeting is happening. And you and I can both know that because we understand um, human behaviour, it's something that we're super interested in and we are looking at different creative ways of connection. But for a lot of companies um, or a lot of people within companies, they don't, that's not what they're thinking. So mm -hmm. it's not their fault. It's just about, I suppose, them listening to these sorts of ideas so they can go, oh, yeah, actually, that makes sense. Because once not. they understand and realise yeah. that it, they need to know that it makes sense. Absolutely. And this was, and I couldn't agree more. And I see a part of maybe 50, let's say maybe 50%, I just made that up, but 50% of probably our work is taking people on that journey where the th going back to your original question around what is it, that what they're buying and, and, you know, how do they bring it in? Like it's, there's what they think they're buying or what they think they're getting, but the more you can help them be on the journey of yes, but this mm. is really what you're buying. This is really what the impact will be, but this is what it's going to take to deliver on that. Yeah. And that's the part I think that, that even personally I need to get better at because I think I, I just assume a lot of the time. Um, it's, it's the same. It's the same thing. If you take an example outside of the workplace and just take it into say a goal, like somebody comes to a health coach because they want to lose weight. Mm. Um, but the health coach, if they're uh, more of a holistic sort of um, works with mindset and doesn't just work with, say, food and exercise, mm. will identify a whole lot of limiting beliefs and a whole lot of um, inner critic and a whole lot of self-worth and a whole lot of all these other things which are holding them back from being able to achieve that goal by, you know, whether the achieving that goal is eating better or, or exercising more, what's holding them back from doing that? And mm -hmm. why aren't they achieving things? And that's just one little example, but it is, it's that same thing as people think they come to you for one thing, but if you're a good facilitator or if you're um, a good coach or anything like that, you'll identify why they really coming to you mm -hmm. and, um, and help them work on that. So sometimes I suppose, not to be your inauthentic, mm -hmm. but sometimes we have to sell things um, with the, with a bit of a hook in mm -hmm. trusting that we are not in a manipulative way, but just mm -hmm. in a way that an actual passionate way of wanting to help them see things differently. Yeah. And that's, and that over time can be exhausting. Yes, we like absolutely. to we like to think of a, a like our business as a Trojan horse. So they sell we sell them this beautiful horse, and then once they we get in, there's all of this other stuff that they're going to get that they didn't realize they were buying, mm -hmm. and that's and that's a beautiful like that helps us as a context. Oh, we want this, great, we'll give you that, and then we'll also give you a bunch of this too. And then at the end of it, you know, it's wanting them to recognize, wow there was all that extra other stuff that we didn't realize prior. And we're so glad that you did that after 
and we can see now that we wouldn't have understood that then but now yeah. having been through that experience it's, it was interesting too just going through the whole of the pandemic we because obviously live events you know ceased to exist for two years so we had to go fully virtual we built a production company and we basically did internal tv shows and virtual experiences for comp uh, for events for companies etc we called pirate tv was our company but a big i'd say the first year definitely 50 percent of the work was taking clients on that journey of this is why you need to think about your virtual events like this mm. this is how da 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 and it was such an education piece around um taking people on that journey the challenge is for people working in the in the world of work that we're in and for those in in organizations is again coming back to this tension of the clock is ticking the days are rolling by you've got mm -hmm. deliverables you've got a boss breathing down your neck you've got clients that want this and that yesterday how do you then make the time for reflection or for expanding your awareness and seeking out nuance and kind of developing yourself uh in a broader richer way so that you can you know find and and um uncover these little easter eggs of beauty and magic that we're talking about mm -hmm. it's so difficult and you've got a mortgage to pay and you've got to get the kids to school and you've got you know deliverables and kpis to hit and it's like wouldn't it be lovely if we could all just sit around and develop ourselves but i've got stuff that needs to get done by close of business today yeah so it's a tricky Look, it's little definitely game. tricky it's definitely tricky and i suppose you know the thing that comes to mind for me is that combination of finding joy in those little in the tasks that are mundane so, you know, ideas of how to do that, um, just purely by reframing them differently or trying to find, you know, like I don't enjoy housework, but when I put music pumping, I enjoy it. Well, I don't enjoy it <laughs> terribly, but I don't mind it. Um, you know, so I think it's sometimes how do we how do we do that? And I think that the working from home thing has helped a lot of people with that because they can say wear more comfortable clothes or they can take get up and take different breaks or they can work in different settings or put music on in the background or do different things like that so I think that that is one way to find the to find the joy in the mundane but also again it's a mindset thing about trusting that you when you take time for things that bring you joy it creates more time in your life because mm -hmm. those things that take forever do not take forever anymore because you feel more focused, you feel more productive, you've got a spark, you feel alive, you're motivated, you're passionate. And if you can connect to that passion of why you're doing what you're doing, which is the original question I asked you about why, you know, and create that meaning, then it's probably, you're going to find that you probably have that time and not always. And, you know, sometimes you've just got a whole lot of stuff you've got to do and sometimes you've just got to accept that reality and and um i suppose find that spot between um between the re real and the ideal mm -hmm. um so, yeah there's a beautiful author by the name of alexander d den den Higer or something i think it's danish or norwegian i apologize if if it's um <laughs> how i pronounce it so poorly but um a great quote he says uh you know, you often feel tired, not because you've done too much, but because, because you've done too little of what sparks a light in you. Absolutely. And this idea that, yeah, yes, a green smoothie and getting to bed early and doing a yoga session can help you combat the, the overwhelm and the exceedingly oppressive schedules we're all living under. But equally, going and doing something that sets your soul on fire suddenly opens up your whole day. It's like, oh, I've got all the time I need. I've got all the energy I need because... I listened to a little Michael Jackson this morning. Yeah, absolutely. So on that, what I want to do now is instead of having to um, sell something as a hook and give more, I want to talk about some things that maybe if some leadership to, leaders are listening or mm -hmm. something like that, that they can um, understand from some of these things. Mm why it is important mm -hmm. and therefore you can just sell what you're going to deliver yeah, yeah great. <laughs> <laughs> so i think that <clears throat> i want to explore that metaphoric metaphoric relationship between life dualities so between say your experience i want to bring your experience into it as mm -hmm. a jazz 
in, that you've experienced in the jazz culture, mm-hmm. in playing music, in making art, and how these skills have helped you and are transferable to business and inspire business success. Yeah. And I want to start by looking at the dualities first. So mm-hmm. the dualities of art making and life. So things like the beauty and the mess, things yeah. like holding on and letting go, chaos and order. You know, they're yeah. some of the dualities that come to mind when I think of art making and when I think of life and business. Love it. Yeah, well, it's it's night, day, love, fear, you know, um, man, woman. I mean, I think we've got th- three or four options in that regard now, but there's um, art is everything. When I first started on this journey, I, I uh, you know, the IP that I was working with, I developed a whole bunch of thinking around, uh, I called it artisan thinking. So there's design thinking, which, you know, we all know quite well now. It was very, very prominent for a while there, which is all about empathizing with your audience, just a deep curiosity. What do they need? Then you create a prototype, then you test it with them, experiment, get even more feedback, then you get that final product. So it's very much about them, 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 design for them. Artisan thinking moves beyond that in thinking, yes, thinking about them, but you can't take yourself out of producing that product or service. Mm. So design thinking is almost as though there's this, there's this non-existent entity that's creating this product for the person or the, for the, the end user. Whereas artisan thinking says, whoever is producing the product or service or art is inextricably linked. Their, their self-expression is embedded in that product, service or art. And let's like illuminate that and highlight that. So you're getting a, co- you know, as a, as an example, you're getting a, a mug of coffee, but it's got, there's, there's defects in it, or there's a, there's a style to it that is unmistakably Lisa, mm. you know, and, and you, and you, it becomes a feature where you buy it because Lisa was the one that made it. And there's a story behind that. But then you, as the producer of that also find so much more fulfillment and meaning in your work, because you don't have to take yourself out of that product or service. It's actually, it is part of it. So you get to invest more of yourself in it. Mm. So there's, a, I think, a much richer relationship formed by buying and selling things to one another in because we're allowing and encouraging and celebrating your expression, mm. your art into what you do. And that's, that's what we, as a great starting point for thinking about what we can take and learn from art. Um, and, and, and to build on that, I mean, even the, the idea of <clears throat> whatever art, whatever discipline you work in, but let's just work with music for a while. The amount of time that uh, that you have to invest into mastering an instrument, there's Mm -hmm. a relationship that's built between you and a guitar where you have, you have a living relationship with that guitar and that the guitar sounds different to this one. And you, you know, you take care of it and you you grow over time, like you would a significant partner. And that's, there's, there's the relationship between you and your instrument. There's a relationship between you and music. Then there's a relationship between you and other musicians. Then there is a relationship between you, your instrument, the music, the musicians, and the audience. And there's all these relationships that are going on simultaneously and you're aware of them. So your, your awareness is so expansive and you're Mm -hmm. tuned in. It's so sensory and the sensibilities that you're training yourself in without knowing is this deep listening, this deep awareness, this, you're being cognizant of so many conversations that are happening at once. Mm. As a transferable skill into uh, you know, the business context, to, be, to have multiple relationships that are all changing and shifting moment by moment, to contribute your ideas and your mm. expressions into creating the song, but then also be responsive enough to then alter what you're playing in response to what the other musicians are playing around you in response to how the audience is behaving as a result of that. There's it's, there's so much all happening and you're just jamming, you know what I mean? And to to think about taking that into the workplace, profound, like everyone should be, every single kid should be doing music for like two full days during their schooling until year 12. It should just be compulsory. (laughs) <laughs> and, and the sad kind of crazy thing is that in many indigenous cultures around the world, it was, everyone was a musician in the tribe. It wasn't segregated and we didn't have, oh, you're naturally talented at that and you're at this and you're at that. We were all everything together. And we mm. had access to these different tools. And so then we all had access to the awareness and insight and inspiration that becomes available when you, you know, spend some time with a particular medium like music, 
mm. or craft or art or whatever it is. Oh, I could talk about this stuff all day. Oh. <laughs> so much we could learn from the arts. <laughs> absolutely. There is absolutely so much we can learn from the arts. But if we pick up from on what you just explained and, you know, the, th the words that came to mind for me was collaborative approach, obviously connection, developing relationships, active, you know, ability mm -hmm. to listen, going with the intuition, mm -hmm. um, self-trust, yep. um, you know, they're, they're so, you know, when to pull back, when to go ahead, yeah. you know, listening for the pause. Like yes. there's so, so much in just what you said then. Mm -hmm. Now that's brilliant for what you have gained by playing music mm -hmm. and, or by doing your art and, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whatever, I think those things would apply no matter what art form it was. Um, so How do other people those get access skills, to them? and then you can bring them into an organization and know how important they are and you've already got those I suppose really good skills so as an employee of that organization you would be really valuable mm -hmm. but how about the fact that you're going in to encourage people to be more creative but they haven't necessarily some of them might have but generally they might have not had a lifetime mm -hmm. or part of a lifetime of embracing art yeah so they don't have those skills so doing in encouraging them to do creative processes mm -hmm. how does that i mean developing these skills is takes time and patience and yes. energy and yes. all of that so how do we how do you close that gap it's not a matter of going all right let me come in and let's do one jam with you all and you know you have a go at the at the um at the piano see how you like it what comes up for you what doesn't come up for you where's your fear what's holding you back are you embarrassed is there shame you know you can explore all those things in a session for somebody mm. but how do you actually get sustainable change within mm. that person you're not going to get that, I wouldn't imagine, by just doing one session. Yes, it introduces something that's obviously better than nothing. Mm. But how do you get that sustainable difference and how do companies really embrace this creative piece to really make a difference in the skills of their employees, in the skills of their leaders, and then hopefully will have an impact on the success of the company? Love it. Great question. And even what you were talking about then at the start, just as a, as a pre caveat, a prologue or whatever you call it, um, is <laughs> a long winded, uh, yeah. a long winded intro to a question. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you were talking about the patience and the discipline yeah. and the attention and the focus that, that, that was invested. They're also skills that you're developing. Mm. So like there is multiple skills you're developing that by doing this, but the beauty is that they start the moment you start. So if you if you just read a novel every night instead of scrolling your phone and looking at Netflix, you would be you would be training your brain in a multitude of different ways. If you then trans you know took that next step and go, okay, I'm, I'm reading not just business books, but I'm reading novel, I'm reading fiction. Mm. Then if you translated that to okay, well I'm, now I'm going to write, I'm going to write for 15 minutes a day. Maybe start with a journal, but then maybe starting to write your ideas. Then, then that 15 minutes extends maybe to half an hour, maybe even an hour a day. Mm. Then, then very quickly, you're going to see the benefits because you're, you are opening your brain. You are connecting your heart. You are, you know, connecting your, your head heart to your hands. And so the way you're perceiving the world, all your experiences, then you're producing something with it and contributing it out into the world in some way. It is so rapid how quickly you know, you will start to see the benefit of doing this. It's unfortunate, again, going back to the nuance or, or the narratives that exist in our world where we think of, I'll go and do some art. It's a nice little hobby you do on the weekend with the kids. You know, it's a Saturday <laughs> afternoon between three and four. I just started a pottery class. Oh yeah, I did some wine and, and painting. Like we did a little vino and we'd have, you know, painting for a bit. For, it was a six week course. Even that, look, there's going to be some benefit from that, but we need to shift from seeing it as some kitsch, fun little thing and start to see it as integral to who we are. And you can say a great parallel to this is mm. health and well-being and fitness. You can say, let's do a big fitness program for our people in an organization. Great. But why is it we did this program for 100 people, but it was only two people 
that went and actually lost a bunch of weight, that changed their behaviors, that built the habits that now are vibrant and alive and have transformed their entire life. Whereas the other 98, you know, they kind of did it for a bit and rah, rah, rah. And there's two kind of answers to this, to this question that you posed. One is you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. So we can do the best we can in creating these opportunities and spaces and trying to offer to organizations, hey, this is really important. This stuff matters. The skills that we're going to need moving into this next you know, realm of whatever it is the world is moving into look vastly different, particularly after mm. the pandemic, but they were going this way anyway. Mm. You've also got massive disengagement. You've got the great resignation or the great realignment, the great reassessment or the great regret, whatever you want to call it, the great whatever. It's happening. It's real. It's alive. It's an employee market. If you want to keep your people engaged and ensure that your talent doesn't jump ship for someone else, you've got to provide them other opportunities and more than just a gym membership and maybe some donuts and a beer on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. These are the kind of opportunities you want to create for them. But then I'd say that the second answer or part two, a of this answer is if you really want to make the most of it as an organization, you have got to back it in. It cannot be a 90 minute masterclass once a year. It cannot be a, a one day offsite or a three day conference every 12 months. And in that half of its strategy, a little bit tactical, you get pissed in the evening, you don't really remember much, but there was this cool session that Mike did. You need to make this like as important as whatever other important processes and systems and weekly meetings that you have. So that is built. I mean, I have people, we have a secret metric that I don't normally share with people, Lisa, but I feel like why not? We're getting fully transparent in this conversation. <laughs> we have a secret metric as part of our business that, that um, we know how successful it's been in a program we deliver or even a keynote is how many people leave their role or leave the organization as a result of our work. And that's not to say that people quit. That's to say that people find an answer for themselves they touch upon a truth that compels them to go i'm working in the wrong area or i'm working in the right area but i want to go for a bigger position a more leadership role or i'm working in the wrong organization completely and i'm going to i'm no good to the organization being here and i'm no good to myself i need to go and find something else but being that catalyst that triggers them to to do something and i think if this is the um this is the power of of this kind of moment is <clears throat> you know, what are we doing? We've got to, we've got to, we've got to throw ourselves into this with reckless abandon because um, it's just so important. Like it, it's, the, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think I, I love getting rolled up about this stuff. I love getting super passionate yeah. about it because, because we've got, we've got, we're giving our lives away to the, the organizations we work for. So basically, basically, <laughs> when you're when you're trying to sell your service to an organization, you're you, you're seriously, if you were being completely transparent, you're saying, what I'm actually coming in to do is a detox of your organization. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and the, but if you embrace that, and some people do, some I've had many leaders say to me, Hey Mike, I love what you do. Can you just not get, make sure, can you just try and not inspire anyone to want to get in a caravan and drive around Australia for a year and quit? <laughs> and I'll say, well, that's really interesting. Would you rather have the dead weight in your organization that's unproductive and is, and is costing you a lot of money and is maybe the, making the culture a bit toxic and rah, rah, would you rather them being there? Or would you rather someone that comes back after a year and says, I'm back, I'm alive. I came up with these incredible you know, insights in my life. I am ready to give myself fully to this organization mm -hmm. or someone that never works for your organization again, but over the next 10 years sends you 10 incredible people because every single you know year they end up having a conversation with someone saying the best organization I ever worked for was X. The leader was incredible because they empowered me to follow my dreams and they supported me in going after what I want, even though that meant leaving their organization. Mm. And that's power. Yeah, and that's, that's courage. Great, yeah. And that's I've a, seen this and I've seen this happen. So I'll keep going on my little rant. That's yeah, kind of that's where I got right. lost before. But but I've seen this happen where people that take it on, you know, if you take that that subsection, that group of 100 people and 98 don't really take it on, but two do. I have seen people and worked with them closely one on one or even small groups or whatever. What they have achieved in six to 12 months in terms of a complete life shift from throwing themselves into creativity or throwing themselves into their self-expression. So creativity is a big broad term, but I like to think of creativity as your self-expression. It's, it's finding and following and expressing, expressing you in the world in some way. 
they've written books, they've started podcasts, they've changed careers, they've started businesses, they've found the love of their life, they have really achieved incredible things. Mm. And it's taken a real amount of courage, like they've had to confront themselves, the imposter stuff, the fear, the blah, 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 blah. But they have never looked back. It's like a line in the sand. And I think the same is true again, as that as that parallel, people that really throw themselves into their health and well being. It's rare that someone goes all in, mm. changes their life, you know, experiences the benefits of it, and then goes, you know what, Doritos on the couch is pretty good. I'm going back to that. Yeah, it doesn't happen. You know, there's, yeah. there's a there's a, a line that's crossed and they go, I'm never going back to that again. Yeah. It's similar with this. I mean, it's the same as relationship dynamics. You can, you know, date, like, you know, have a toxic relationship, toxic relationship, toxic dynamic, and then you hit a point and you go, I can't do this anymore. And then you... <laughs> We've all got one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting. And I think that there's a, there is a another sweet spot which exists, I, I believe, between... Um, holding on and letting go of a particular role and that is is the art of good conversation mm -hmm. so just because someone attends and has these epiphanies within a session that you might run and they're like no this isn't satisfying me and I can't do this and I can't do that I don't think necessarily always the right answer is to abandon that situation because mm. that's that could depending on <coughs> that person's um i suppose life experiences or trauma or anything like that that could be buying into just another pattern running away of what they do of running yeah. away yeah absolutely. so that's when it takes good communication <laughs> and good conversational skills both by an assertiveness and confidence and trust that they can then have that conversation with the person in the company and that person in the company has the ability to listen mm and listen properly to then go all right well how can we how can we work together in order to um meet your needs and sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work but i think that there's this space that's often missing or this skill set that's often missing to be able to have a really artful conversation absolutely and, and i absolutely and i would say that it comes back to the context or the original intent of what an organization is or what a leader does. And, and a big part of our work is we try to help organizations or companies and leaders recontextualize their reason for being from, from merely profit seeking to unleashing human potential. So if people start to see their organizations and if leaders start to see their role less as we need to hit these numbers and, and make profit for our shareholders and more as we are this ecosystem this fertile garden for unleashing potential, then that potential channeled in their particular ways will of course deliver positive, profitable returns, but it will also deliver this, this multitude of other things that you can't possibly fathom. Mm. And, and, and if a leader's role is less about, I have to corral my people down this thing, make sure they hit their KPIs, do what they're told and keep their heads down and bum up. We're well, yeah. going to get a particular kind of result and then obviously burn out and all this kind of stuff is you're going to keep getting the same of what you've got. But if your role was unleashing their potential, their potential could then be used in the organization in new ways, or maybe their potential is actually, you know what, I think I've, I've done my limit here in this team or in this company, I'm ready for that next thing, but I will forever be grateful and know you and tell the world about what you did for me, which in terms of employer branding or talent acquisition, you can't buy that kind of stuff. Mm. It's golden. And, I, and there's one kind of other point I'd love to make is that what I would love to see and what I try to promote as much as possible is that we start to hero and celebrate the leaders that have the courage to back this mm. stuff in because we Absolutely. love celebrating leaders that have delivered returns. We love celebrating teams and leaders that have made a bunch of money or that have finished their project on time or have got great customer satisfaction, blah, 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 blah. But what about the leaders or the, you know, the, the managers or the teams or the, or the C-suite or whoever that have, that have made a, a disciplined commitment in the face of all of the other stuff to go, our people matter mm. and their, their development matters and their well being matters and their creativity matters. So we are going to invest in this in you know cash but also time and resources and rah, 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 so that they can 
you know, they can grow and develop as people. Because this will be the next wave when we talk about, um, you know, the great resignation, all these things. How do we keep people engaged? How do we keep people working mm. for our organisation? It's moved beyond, like we said before, gym memberships and craft beer on a Friday night. At the moment, you know, we're talking about our oh, career opportunities and flexibility. You don't have to come into the office, but, you know, we also want to, you can do job share and you can do this. And yeah, that's cool. That's one part. I, I firmly believe the next wave of what we're going to see is organizations will need to start offering personal development, mm. which is around, I don't know who I am, but if, you know, I don't know what I want. I don't know what I'm good at. So if your organization can be a, a, a space, a safe space, but a a regenerative space where people can go and figure out their unique gifts and talents and how they can apply them in the world. And for some of that journey, it might still continue at this organization, but it might mean that they go somewhere else. You, that's the biggest competitive advantage on the planet. I couldn't agree more. And I actually wrote a comment about that on someone's post um, actually yesterday on LinkedIn um, about the only way we're going to get change is if we, instead of just looking at um, professional development, we look at personal development, which for me, I think is one of the same, mm. um, but other people don't. And we really got to get people to become more self-aware, to connect with their values, to be able to um, recognize their needs and then be able to communicate them with clarity and assertiveness and if you can do that then we're going to get a whole um like you said a, an ecosystem which which promotes success both personally and professionally for people which then retains people um, or lets them go because it isn't the right fit and ultimately if you look you know at a bigger picture and look at you know big thinking I mean, we're all just a whole lot of humans doing a whole lot of things every single day and one of them happens to be work. And every time we bump into another human, we're just bumping into somebody and having an interaction. And the, those interactions are just making us grow as, as people, no matter what um, location that they're in. Mm. But, you know, it was interesting to hear what you just said about that feedback needed for, um, for managers and leaders. And... Um, I also, I put something up about this as well, because I was ha writing a, um, I'm just in the process of writing some content for a leadership workshop that I'm doing. And, mm. and I was just having this thought and all this thinking about um, <coughs> humanizing workplaces and all this stuff about what leaders have to do for their employees. And I thought, well, leaders are just humans themselves and they have the same needs of being acknowledged seen and validated as well mm -hmm. and how if we're gonna we want to employ employees want to be seen as humans then we've got to start seeing leaders as humans and not oppressors mm -hmm. and it's got to go in a cycle so we've mm -hmm. got to be able to i mean how often do you know leaders really get acknowledged for like you said of making someone feel good or you know of or doing taking yeah. courageous risks or all those sort of things so yeah i love that you um that you picked up and you know on that because yeah i really i agree with you i think that it's got to be it's got to be circular and we've got to you know let's let's stop with this top down patriarchal model and let's start having a more circular um let's you know, economy, not just economy, but workplace interactions, mm. connections, relationships. And absolutely celebrating and reaffirming behaviors that are that are about your character and about your values and about the effort that you've put into supporting and sustaining the people around you, as opposed to heroing, celebrating, recognizing the numbers, you know, the projects delivered, the impact on the bottom line, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I mean, that just feeds the same narrative, ego, politics, all of that stuff is is one rung under that. But if we can be celebrating people for, hey, man, it's amazing that you took that extra hour to talk to Sally Ann. You know, I know no one else saw that, but I know that's well, that's why you weren't on that meeting. And that's, yeah. that's incredible that you did that. And I've seen the impact that that's had on her and her relationship with her husband and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah beautiful. exactly. So it's also not just the person that experiences it, but it's also the people that witness it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that this... is, I mean, it's that same idea, I suppose, of of the science behind gratitude and how it, it releases those endorphins um, when we give gratitude, when we receive gratitude, and also when we witness gratitude. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. then it gives permission for other people to do it. And then there's a ripple effect and a pay it forward. And, um, you know, we get a nice, big, generous world. Um <laughs> Peace, love and happiness. Yeah. Sunshine, um, rainbows, fairy tales yeah. of love. So it. let's just um, from... I know that we're pushing time probably, but let's just for a second or for more than a second, probably for some minutes, um, let's now look at the idea that companies have embraced the idea that we need to be creative and that they want to bring more creative play, mm. right? But then we've got the people who um, haven't got, haven't done creative activities for years now that mm -hmm. they're adults. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think of that Pablo Picasso quote of um, every child's an artist and the problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. Mm -hmm. So there's this gap between kids and adults. Why do you think that is? And do we lose our inability to think creatively and play? Mm. Yeah, we suppress it. It gets diluted and reduced definitely. It's, it's a condition of what's the conditioning of society and corporate life and, and all of that stuff. Um, but quite often I'll say in our sessions and, and whenever we're delivering stuff, it's less about becoming more creative and more about remembering. Mm. Rem remembering who you were before that yeah. thing happened, before you were corralled along to do a marketing degree or a financial degree because you thought that would, your dad told you that that's the way to financial security, et cetera, et cetera. None of those are bad choices. They're just choices that happened. And no one's at fault for this. No one's to blame. It's not some conspiracy. It's just the way of the world right now. In the last 50, 100 years, industrial revolution, revolution to then corporate culture, modern life. Um, yes, it has absolutely reduced our creative capacity. But science tells us we're all born with roughly the same creative capacity. Um, there's a beautiful guy called George Land. I talk about him a bit. He... Um, he was the guy that developed one of the first ever creativity tests, how you could measure creativity. And they used him to find the, the brightest minds on the planet to help NASA get to the, the moon back in the you know, 70, late 60s, 70s. Um, and he was, a, he was a genius guy. And he did this experiment then with kids and found that you know 98% of, of five-year-old kids have roughly the same creative capacity as these geniuses that got us to the moon in the 70s, 60s, 70s. Um, but then at 10, at 10, it went from 98% to 32 percent and then at 15 it went to 14 percent and then at 30 it's down to two percent so he, what he was known for you know his big claim to fame he said the research is conclusive non-creative behavior is learned so what we've discovered from this experiment is that we learn how to be not creative so mm. the world writ large we go to school then we go to uni if we're lucky then we get a job in the world rah, rah. We're being taught, we're being conditioned out of our creativity. Mm. And the most watched TED talk of all time is by Sir Ken Robinson. And it's uh, it's a talk called Do Schools Kill Creativity? He talks about George Land's research. Oh, I've in seen there. that, yeah. But it's true. And so, yes, this is what we're up against in, in, in an organisational context, but that it comes back to this point of the results come thick and fast. They come quickly because it's already in us. Yes. We just need to be given the opportunity, but we can't just get the opportunity once a year. It needs to be consistent. We need to be supported at mm. every level of the organization. So from leadership all the way down to frontline and everything in between, it can't just be fun. We can't see it as a novel hobby, hobby or a team building activity. It needs to be seen as deep capability building, training, learning and development. And it needs to be consistent and it needs to be, um, it just needs to be seen, going back to the nuance that we're talking about, from the start of this conversation, it needs to be valued in a way that we, um, yeah, that, that we back it in. And then, and that we, we, and then, and then from that, I mean, to put a nice little bow on this conversation, when, when you start doing that, the more that you spend time in that space, creating, learning, absorbing, listening, et cetera, et cetera, you can't help yourself, but you do start to, you start to see music differently and you start to see art differently and short film differently. And, and Netflix takes on a new tone for you. It's not just something you have on in the background. You're like, oh my God, there's, a lot of work has gone into Stranger Things. This is an incredible series, you know, rah, 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 rah. Then you start to apply that in your work and your relationships with your clients and your colleagues. And then very quickly, your whole experience of life now has more depth and breadth to it, where then you will see more opportunities, not just to create, you know, to express yourself in ways, but ways to create spaces that enable others to express more of themselves. 
And that's when we get peace, love, happiness, sunshine, rainbows, lollipops, magic, Michael Jackson. <laughs> and life bit. becomes a melody. Yeah, that's right. Beautiful <laughs> alliteration. <laughs> Uh, uh, brilliant beautiful. so that basically brings full circle to my introduction of you today where I said that this conversation will highlight that your creative playful spark always resides within you and it's just patiently waiting for you to reconnect with it so that you can thrive personally and professionally love it and you know what and even a caveat to that is maybe it's not so patient as it once was Maybe that spark in you is desperate yes. to be unleashed. It is like banging its fists on the door of your heart. It's inside going, let me out. I want to sing. I want to dance. I want to play. Please start listening to me. Yes. And we need to start listening. Yes, absolutely agree. So what do you think? I'm going to put you on the spot here. <laughs> I just thought of this. Um, you know, it's been an hour approximately that we've had this conversation for so far. And that's, you know, a fairly um, long time for people to be attentive and listen. And, um, and I think maybe it would be nice to reward those that have stayed until this time. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they might like to have a little listen to some incredible composition that you might just like to wow, play that... considering you're in a room of I am. instruments. I am. Unfortunately, the, these instruments need to be amplified and they're not plugged in right now. They're old vintage keyboards. Oh. Um, so I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear them. They're, they're kind of, you'll just hear the clamoring of the keys. You're like, duh, 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 duh. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, and the guitars might be out of tune. So I'm not even sure that that, I haven't, I haven't given you what much. I'm hearing. What I'm hearing, Michael, is that reasons and excuses and, excuse <laughs> and, and a bit of worry that you're going to come across not as professional or as skilled as, no, not as at you all. might be. <laughs> no, I get it. Not at all. I will give them, I will see how out so of now you can feel is. how others feel when they Hear have it. Yep. So that's how, this that's is, how this it might is, sound if I play. This is my kids. My kids get into my room and they mess with all my guitars and they, so they're never in tune. Hang on, I'll test, I'll check another one. Um, what do we got here? Let's see. Well, that sounds all right. It's a little bit better, but not really. Um, I'll play, I'm also in the garage for those that, for those that are listening. I'm in the, my cold little garage. Oh dear. Um, I'm not even going to bother with that. Oh, how about a poem? I'll give you a poem. How about that? Perfect. Uh, let's see if I can remember it. Twas a balmy autumn evening, if my memory is correct, that I embarked upon a voyage with my heart and intellect. Turned out to be a fishing trip. I hadn't planned on it so soon, but the wind was from the east and I was beckoned by the moon. I quickly chose my fortune way down in the deep south. My eyes drooled with excitement as I, no, flickered with excitement as I drooled from my mouth. I packed up all my baggage I acquired through the years. Lies, deceit and disbelief I kept alive in frozen tears. Then drove into the night contemplating my big catch. Totally prepared, I thought that I might just meet my match. So focused on my goal, I threw caution to the wind, unaware the fog had thickened and the storm was closing in. By the time I reached the boat, the waves were several metres high. Told myself I wasn't scared, but knew it was a lie. The boat and I were tossed about. The rain would pierce my face. The salt was poisoning my eyes and fear was all I could taste. Ah, oh, fuck. Until it all, it's been a while, hang on. And fear, until it all stopped raging, an eerie calm fell over us. We were in the eye of the storm with no one left to trust. Without a second thought, I baited up my line. I cast my reel as best I could to see what I could find. I waited patiently, my eyes would comb the unknown, but with every breath I took, I felt more and more alone. Without a second thought, before I'd realized what I'd done, the beast had taken the base bait and the battle had begun. I wrestled with the monster back and forth and to and fro, but the angrier I got, the more the monster seemed to grow. It was feeding on my pain, devouring all my hate. How could I expect to beat it with my mind in this state? I didn't care. I couldn't take any responsibility. It hurt too much to see how much of this beast was inside of me. So I fought until I fell into a heap upon the deck. Reality was lost at sea. My strength was but a speck to be washed away at dawn with the heartless rising tide. My ship was slowly sinking. My humanity had died. Then the ocean swallowed us at no more than a crawl. 
I had time to realize there was no monster at all with only my blood on myself. No one else was ever here. Oh, hang on. Oh, I forgot the end bit. A mirror in my right hand. The evidence was clear with only my blood on myself. No one else was ever here. So I let myself be taken to the bottom of the sea and died with my eyes open, which was more than enough for me. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a messy, a messy, imperfect, um, you know, display of self-expression. And we can all, Perfect. we can and all was, just do it. Was, it. It was great that it was imperfect because that's what we're talking about. Embracing imperfection, you know, turning mistakes into melodies. And chords <laughs> like this. You know, the whole Exactly. Bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for entertaining us with that um, beautiful, insightful, wise poem, even if it there were parts that you um, had to pause. I and think it's been 20 yeah. years since I've said that poem, so I'm quite impressed at myself. I managed to dig that out of the subconscious somewhere. Oh, see, yeah. that's going to give you a spark for the rest of the day. This is true. This is very true. <laughs> yeah, we need more. We didn't talk about poetry today, but I think that that's, there's, God, there's some power in poetry. You know, David White, everyone should check out David White, W-H-Y-T-E. Yeah. Spend yeah. some time with him and that'll, that's all you need to take from this podcast. Yeah, there's a brilliant poem of his that I, oh, I can't remember it now. I'm hopeless um, at the moment with memory. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a really, there's a poem of his that I actually really like. So I think that um, it would probably be a fantastic space to conclude um, and, and wind up. We've covered a lot of information. We've covered a lot of the parallels between you know, and the dualities between creativity and business success. We've looked at um, a lot of the skills that are transferable. we are looked at a new type of leadership, a new type of organisation, um, all employee, the, the decisions that people make, um, why you do what you do. Um, yeah, people embracing, embracing creativity and the benefit of that. And, um, and yeah, so I think that we've covered a lot and I was going to ask you, you know, where you see this future of work um, for far in five years time, all these conversations that are happening, um, but maybe we'll have to leave that to another one. <laughs> yeah, we'll do, that, that can be episode two. Episode two. Yeah. Perfect. Amazing. So if anybody who's listening today, had they be a creative themselves, have they been an employee, have they been a business owner or a leader at a company and they wanted to get a little bit more connected with you whether it be through you listening to some of your music or whether it be some of the courses and keynotes that you offer how did they do that michaeldixon.com m-y-k-e-l-d-i-x-o-n.com and there's a newsletter i haven't highlighted it enough on the um on the website, but just scroll down to the bottom of all the pages, you'll see there's a little subscriber sign up box like most people have. I do not promote that enough, but my goodness, I spend a whole lot of, I spend hours on that newsletter and there is a lot of juicy insights and videos that I make and, and VIP content that I don't share with the world, but I just share with that subscriber list. So that's a very good place to start. Fantastic. And then events and whatever else, there's always kind of discounts and, you know, cool ex subscriber only exclusives that happen on there. So that's always a good well, way. Well, I'll those links in the show notes below as Amazing. well. Amazing. Send those to me. Fantastic. So thanks um, for so many of your valuable insights today. And for anybody listening, thank you for taking the time. Thanks for getting to this part of the conversation and your interest in today's conversation. And both Michael and I would love to know what's your biggest insight from today's conversation? What's your biggest takeaway? Leave a comment and let us know. And if you have enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your network and consider subscribing to the Wealthy Living podcast on your favourite podcast app and also to the Wealthy Living YouTube channel. To find out a little bit more about my services, you can connect with me through my website at wealthyliving.com.au. It's W-E-L-L-T-H-Y living.com.au. Or you can connect with me on any of my social media channels. So until next time, remember, 
connection is medicine. <laughs>